Thank you, worship team. And good morning to those of you who may have come in since I was up here last. For those of you who may not know, we're studying through the book of Galatians and we've worked our way up to chapter three. Today we'll be focusing in on verses 15 through 18. Our sermon is entitled, God's Changeless Promise. God's Changeless Promise. And so we're gonna go ahead and have a word of prayer and go ahead and get started. So let's go ahead and pray together. Father, we thank you for our worship today. We thank you for the truth of those songs that we heard today, that we sung this morning. And we do thank you for your love and we thank you for your plan. And we thank you for the grace that put it all together. And Lord, we thank you that it's all there because of the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, as we get into this book of Galatians, that's really the theme and the key is that, Father, some people were coming along saying, it takes more than that. It's a lot more than the faithfulness of Christ. And you need to do some things to earn God's love. You need to do some things to stay in his love. And so, Father, they were leaving out the part about he doesn't give up on you and his love never changes. And so, Father, that's what this book is about. And I pray that as we get into it today, we'll be able to com communicate that. And it all is a part of what we call the gospel. So, Father, we are trusting you to have your way. And as we started out this service today, we pray and ask that God, the Holy Spirit, would dominate, that he would permeate, and that he would resonate all that, we, that happens here today, including the sermon. So we commit this time to you. And we ask these things in the name of your Lord, our Lord, excuse me, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to have a scripture reading from Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to be reading the first 14 verses. Today, we'll be focusing on, as I said, verses 15 through 18. So we're going to be looking at the beginning of the chapter to give us our context. I pick it up at Galatians chapter 3 at verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law? or by hearing with faith. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. God's changeless promise. I touched on it just for a second, but we're going to touch on it some more why the book of Galatians. We need to know why the book is even written. And I told you last week, and we'll tell you very briefly now, Paul was on his first missionary journey. He was joined by a man by the name of Barnabas and a man by the name of John Mark. They went to an area called Galatia there in Asia Minor, and they got some people saved. God saved some people. And then from there, they took those saved people and they created some churches. And so this letter is written to a group of churches. After Paul left, he put everything in place. We had some people come in, and we're going to call them gospel distorters. They came in, and they said, oh, what Paul told you can't be right. That can't be, can't be all there is to it. And so they 
distorted the gospel or perverted the gospel that Paul had shared with them. And so what happened after they came in is the Galatians started turning. They were turning away from God. And we saw in Galatians chapter one, verse six, they were turning away from God. They were turning away from his gospel and they were turning away from his grace. And so they had tasted of all three, but they were turning away. Why? Because they didn't really have a deep understanding of what they had heard. And so as we get into this today, I want to bring out our first point today, something that was really brought to my attention this week is that, you know, you come to church and you hear things and you might come to church and hear them for years. But, you know, a lot of times we can come to church and hear things and we really don't know what we hear. We think we do. We can say, well, I've heard that. I've, I've heard that message before. I've heard that verse before, but we really don't know it and we don't understand it. And so when we get into this, there are two ways that you and I can discover if we really know something. Number one is try to teach it to someone else. Try to teach it to someone else. That's one of the things that we can do is try to teach it to someone else. And then another thing is go around and have a discussion with someone that doesn't believe what you believe and see if you can still stand up at the end of the day. When we don't understand what we believe, what happens to us is we start waffling around, we start blowing around. And the Bible calls it um, every wind of doctrine. And it creates a picture that the wind starts blowing. And when we don't know what we know, we start doing like this and we start changing. And a person, if they're knowledgeable enough and good enough at it, they can actually talk us out of what we really believe. Why? It's not necessarily about our willpower, it's because we don't know what we believe enough to really understand it and then communicate it and be able to defend it. And so we want to really go there, you know, as we're talking about the Holy Spirit dominating and permeating and resonating, we want to just bring it to our minds. Maybe you want to write this down today. Do I really know and do I really understand what I believe? And then here's where you really want to start. Ask this question. Do I really know, do I really understand what the gospel of the grace of God is, what the gospel of the grace of God is, because that's what we're talking about here. Paul shared with them the gospel of the grace of God. These people came around and said, uh-uh, that gospel of the grace of God, and they started attacking these people verbally, questioning these people, and what the Galatians ended up doing was, we don't know what we're doing, and Paul says, wait a minute, wait a minute, and it's not his fault he says that I portrayed this thing publicly and clearly. You saw, you saw the best verbal and, 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 and most, uh, how, I, how, how should I say it? You had the best preaching and teaching that money could ever buy when I was there. I portrayed Christ publicly and clearly. I, pre, I created that portrait. But sometimes we don't want to ask questions. Sometimes we're just there to hear and go home. I want to challenge you today. You know, we've been talking to the choir a lot. We're probably talking to people who are not, you know, not the people in front of you. But I want to challenge us today. Do you really know? Do you really understand? If your life depended on it today and you walked out of church today and someone said, you, sir, you, ma'am, could you explain the gospel of the grace of God to me? Could you explain it, ma'am? Could you explain it, sir? Could you? Or would you say, get, get, get somebody in the church and they'll explain it to you? So that happens to them. They had a lack of under, uh, understanding. So get this, a lack of understanding in anything in life brings an instability. So when the winds start blowing, we become unstable because we don't have that understanding. So he writes this letter to stabilize them, to remind them of things that they already know. Well, who is Paul then? Who is Paul? Well, we went over this, but let's say it just one more time. He's an apostle. He's not just any old apostle. He's an apostle that the, this book is teaching was sent by Jesus Christ and God the Father. And he was sent by the risen Christ. The risen Christ had a personal interview with him and he sent him to go and do these things that he's doing. He was given apostolic authority. He was given power. And then this is what we're talking about. And he was given a gospel called the gospel of the grace of God. Sometimes he calls it Christ's gospel. And sometimes he calls it my gospel. 
He's talking about my gospel. And so he was given that gospel. He's there now trying to stabilize this church. He can't get to them. So he's stabilizing them through this letter. That's what he wants to do. So he gives them some reminders. He reminds them that they were saved because they believed the message. They were saved because they believed the message of the gospel of the grace of God. The people coming behind them, behind Paul, were saying, you need to keep the Mosaic law in addition to that. You need to become circumcised in addition to that. You need to become Jewish in addition to that. And so he's saying, no, no, none of that was what saved you. You're saved already. You were saved by believing the message that you heard. And what is the gospel of the grace of God? That Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again for our sins. We believe that, we receive that, and it is totally on, based on the faithfulness of Christ, and it's by grace through faith plus nothing else. Grace through faith, God's unmerited favor. You're taking him at his word. We are believing what he said. We're receiving it, and that is all that God is requiring. God's love is on you. God has not given up on you, not really based on you, as important as you are. It's based on the faithfulness of his son. Your sins have been dealt with through the gospel of the grace of God. God is not looking at you through sin glasses. God is not looking at you through performance glasses. God is not looking at you through religious glasses. God is not looking at you through moral glasses. He is looking at you through the faithfulness glasses that his son has provided. And so he reminds them, you believe the message. That's how you got saved. He reminds them, you received God, the Holy Spirit into your life by believing the message, not something you did or something you stopped doing. You did it. It was about believing the message that you heard. And then he reminded them, everything that has happened to you all there in Galatia, the miracles that we saw happen, everything that happened to you happened to you because you believed the message. Do you ever remember me bringing the law to you? Do you ever remember me saying you need to be a Jew? Did you ever remember me saying you need to be circumcised? No, you need to believe the gospel. You got all of those blessings, including your healing, because you believed the message, not because of something you did or did not do. You were declared righteous. You were justified. You were made all right with God. How? By believing the message. God said, you believe the message, you're all right with me. And the Bible says you are declared righteous or justified. That's what that means. Why? Because you believe the message that you heard. And they did not have to clean up their life first to believe the message. You believe the message, the Holy Spirit comes in and he then dominates, he then permeates, and he then resonates. And then he is how your life is changed and cleaned up. You got to get that. There are some very well-known, very well-known big-time preachers that tell you you've got to clean your life up first and then believe the gospel. This is the kind of thing that this book is written to combat. No, come, believe the message, and let God come in and clean house. Do you see the difference? There's a big difference here. This book is very relevant to your life. It is very, very relevant. He said, all this happened to you. God did this because you believe the message. So these people were coming in and they were name dropping. And to a Jewish person, Mr. Abraham is everything. That song we sung today, I am a friend of God, that all comes from this thought, Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham was a friend of God. The Bible says Abraham was a friend of God. That is big. That is huge. Abraham was a friend of God. So they're like, you know, you want to be like Abraham and all of that. And so, you know, we have all these things that come from Abraham. And so Paul says, do you really want to go there? And so he says, let's go there. And he says, Abraham, this friend of God, this MVP of faith, do you know how he got every blessing that he ever received? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. You believe God, the gospel, and it is accounted to you as righteousness. He says, oh, you want to go with Abraham? I got gotcha. you. Do you realize Abraham received every blessing he ever received simply because he believed what God was saying? And folks, you got to get it. He didn't believe that Jesus Christ died for his sins and all of that. He believed that God said, 
You and I are going to have a relationship and I'm going to create a nation out of you. I'm going to give you a child. It says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So we need to understand what is God calling you to believe today? You need to know, we need to know what is God calling us to believe today? And so Abraham believed God and he was called a friend of God. He was the MVP of faith. And it was about what? Because he took God at his word. And so to really be a friend of God, you must believe God. And then to do what God calls you, what that belief calls you to, don't make it too hard. What God is calling you to today, no matter what your name is, is to be a friend of God in this sense, to trust him, to trust him, to trust him when you can't see what's going on, to trust him when you don't understand, when it, to trust him when you seem to be stuck and everybody else seems to be going forward, to trust him when you're going forward, but you're by yourself, to trust him. That is what the Bible calls living by faith. And the Bible says, under this dispensation, under this gospel of the grace of God, the main thing that God is calling us to do is to live by faith, to believe what he says and act like what he says is true. We make things way too hard. You know, we do. We make things way too hard. God wants you to trust him. And then he reminded them, it's not about the law of Moses. Well, Moses gave the law and all of that. It's not about that. And so he says, no, 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 it's not about that either. There is a new sheriff in the religious town. There is a new sheriff in the religious town. It is not the Mosaic law anymore. This new sheriff in the new religious town, his name is HS. It is God, the Holy Spirit. We are not doing the Mosaic law anymore. We are doing God, the Holy Spirit, dominating lives, filling lives, leading lives, magnifying Christ, glorifying God. This is what I want done. It's a living relationship. It takes faith to trust God, the Holy Spirit using the word. That's what the new sheriff is doing. That is what the triune God is calling each and every one of us to do today. Follow the lead of my Holy Spirit as he uses the word of God in your life. It's not about the Mosaic law. People think they, they are keeping the Mosaic law, don't they? Give me a little response. Give me a little something, don't they? They really do. Um, you run into people that are coming to you that are, are maybe even saying that we are the new Jews and we need to keep that mosaic law. You're running into anybody that is saying, you know what? It's about being uh, like looking like Jewish people, Judaism and, and on those type of things. And when you ask them, do you know about the gospel of the grace of God? They make statements like we left that behind. What we're doing is more superior. Hello? Anybody? Anybody? I know that's on the social media. I know some of you people are talking to some of these folks. We're not mentioning names or anything like that because some of them listen to, listen to this preacher right here. But we got to deal with truth. What is God saying? And what is God saying at a particular time for a particular people? What is he saying to the church, the body of Christ who's sitting right here right now? And so Paul says, uh-uh, there's, the, there's a new sheriff. We're not under law. He's, he just comes right out and says that, you know, he says in Romans 6, 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because you're not under law, you're under grace, okay? And so some people think they're keeping the law. I just want to show you this now. I can't, you can't, can you, you can't even see the fine print on this. This is one page and there are 11 pages. There are 613 laws here. And if you think you even have a spitting chance of trying to keep all these laws, let me tell you, because some of them are so detailed and so intimate, you can't get your mind around it. Talking about mixing clothes and how you cook and what you do and what you don't do. I mean, there's 613. I've got them all listed here. Somebody put them together for me. Nobody's keeping all of this. And Paul says, no, don't let them people bring these laws in and say, you got to keep them. You can't do it. It was never intended for that. What the law is supposed to do is to show us how holy God is, how high his standards are. I mean, guys, we're asking questions about things. We, you know, we, we, we're asking questions now. We, we're looking at everything. Is that right? Is that wrong? Um, what is God saying about, you know, it's like things have gotten so muddled now that you're kind of like, oh boy, you better keep your head in here because there is no right and wrong anymore, right? And we're just talking about the little kids who are getting brainwashed in school and in daycare. You know, the rest of us are retired at home, maybe they're watching the TV or TV watching us, 
but they are being indoctrinated about there is no right or wrong. There is no God. Someone has said it this well. We said it in this sermon before. Most of our young kids coming up do not even know who Abraham is. Friend of God, who's God? Who's Abraham? That's where we are. Wrong is right and right's wrong. And you know, your, your goal is to figure out what sex you want to be. And we're not talking about when you get up in school, we're talking about down here. You know, um, you pay the bill at the college. Your, your daughter or son's name is not whatever their name is. You have to say she, her, what their pronoun is to be when you're sending your check in, not their name. You got to do the pronoun first. That's where we are. Oh, you keep the law. The law is to show us how holy God is. You see? And then the God and the law is to show us, please don't be offended, how unholy we are. Oh, come on. We got to get it. We are rationalizing and thinking logically to a lot of conclusions that are wrong. We're excusing sin in our own lives. We're excusing sin in our, our, in, in, our in, in other people's lives. It's supposed to show us how unholy we are too. And then here's the great thing. As you study your Bible, as you get into this, we're talking about the gospel of the grace of God. We're talking about the grace of God. We're talking about the apostle to the Gentiles with this, this grace message. And what is the law supposed to do? It's supposed to make grace and simply believing the message the most attractive thing you've ever seen in your life. You mean that's all I have to do is believe the message? After all of this, oh, I'll take that. That is what the law is supposed to do. And it also was to be a tutor for the nation of Israel till Christ came so that they could get out from under it and have a relationship and get under the new sheriff, God, the Holy Spirit as well. So listen to me. What is today? July 11th, 2021. All over around this city, you may know somebody. Somebody's coming to you saying, you need to get under this. You really aren't doing anything right now. You need to get under this. You really don't have as much as you should. You're really not the right people. You really don't even have the right name. You need to get under this. Folks, do you know? Do you understand? We have to be able to stand on God's word and say, no, uh-uh. You know, I do understand. No, let me share with you about what God is doing today. Amen? Nobody's keeping this anyway. I don't care how impressive they are. When you get into all the details of this, folks, there is no way you're keeping this. I'm talking about this talks about all the things that we do. Just in everyday life. Just in everyday life. So I better hurry up here. But we're not. So he tells them, you know, you're not under the law either. That's not it. And anybody, and then he gets deep on him. He says, and if you want to go there, you're going to try it. You want to be convinced. You have to keep the law perfectly. If you don't keep it, you're under a curse. What does that mean? You will be eternally separated from God, trying to get to him by keeping the law, trying to get to him with your own morality, trying to get to him with your own list of do's and don'ts, try to get to him and say, you're all right. You never killed anybody. It will result in separation from Almighty God because you didn't keep it perf perfectly. So again, the law is a good thing. Don't get the wrong impression. The law is a good thing, but it's got a purpose. It's to show again, bear with me, how holy God is. And to show again how unholy we are. And then when we get it all figured out and we really study it and we understand, oh my goodness, all this grace that's been lavished on us because of the faithfulness of Christ I get all of that because of his faithfulness. I'll take that. Thank you. That's what the law is supposed to do. That is what the law is supposed to do. So he's telling them, stick with having faith. Okay, stick with hearing by faith. And then he get in, got into it, and we've already went over it. He goes back to their experiences. We already went over that. Hey, you guys, you got saved. You had this, this track record. You got the Holy Spirit. You got healed. It was all because you believed. Then the whole thing with Abraham, you know the whole story. No, Abraham believed he did the same thing you did. He was a preview. We talked about that. And then the law, you know, you can't do that. So today we go to verse 15 now, and he has one more argument in this particular section. And he says another thing that you can use 
that I want to use to get you to understand, to get you to think, to get you to reason to the right conclusion is you need to look at the way God keeps his promises. You need to look at the way God keeps his word. So what we're going to do is let's read verses 15 through 18. I'll read them out loud. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. What I am saying is this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. God's changeless promise. Now, as we get into these verses, the first verse is verse 15, and there's an umbrella there. There's an umbrella. There's some things under this umbrella, but the umbrella we're gonna call the permanence of covenants illustrated. The permanence of covenants illustrated. That's our umbrella. So as we get into verse 15, what he's talking about, well, let's start with the first um, verse there, brethren. Some of this has been hard for them to handle. You know, it's hard to have somebody come into you and tell you these different things that can be kind of tough. So he says, brethren, he's kind of kind of softening it up again. My brothers and sisters, he's, he's showing some love to them. And as we get into it, he says, okay, I'm going to change gears on you now. And he says, I want to speak in terms of human relations. So in other words, he says, let's talk about what men and women do on our planet. Okay, we're going to talk about what men and women do on our planet. And we're going to use an example from everyday life. He's saying there in verse 15. He says, when, when, when man makes a covenant, when we come under a contract, we come under agreement. Uh, let's go on and deal with this. Death is all around us, all over the place. When we write up our will, get it all ready, got everything all changed, and all, I'm, I'm ready to go. When a man does that, you know, um, these things are stable. They're solid. People don't go in and start changing them. Okay, are you following that? Now, now just take, let me just take a little heat off for a second, just kind of have a little light, lightness here. Um, you know, I know, I know a person that um, had the wheel all out. Lawyers have put everything on it, everybody stamped and everything else. And this particular person was set, you know, so we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm all ready to go. And when everything's, everything's taken care of, everybody understands. But then if you got in an argument with this person, they would go get their pen and start marking stuff out on the wheel, start, you know, crossing things out on the wheel. Like that really changed the will. If you're going to do that, you got to go all back through the process again. You can't just, when you feel like it, go in there and pencil somebody out or then you done fell in love with somebody and pencil them in. It doesn't work like that. When you do that, that will thing is locked in unless you officially go to the lawyers, officially get that thing changed. Are you all understanding what I'm saying? We do stuff like that. There are exceptions. But what this text is assuming is that everybody understands when you do your will, when you get in a contract, you sign papers, whatever it is, you have to stick with what you've signed. You can't get a whim and say, oh, I don't want to do this or throw it in the trash and say it's no good or add something to it. So he's saying, I just want to set you up. Let me use examples of men and covenants or contracts. OK, and so that's what he's doing there in verse 15. He's saying, let's just look at everyday life. The bottom line, a contract is binding. OK, you got to stick with the contract. So then he goes to verse 16 and, and then he goes, let me read it. It says, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, he does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. And so he starts to talk to them about the promises, okay? Remember, God told Abraham, I'm gonna make a great nation out of you, okay? And, and all these people on the earth are gonna be blessed because of you. And what our Bibles are teaching us in Galatians, they were gonna be blessed the same way that Abraham was blessed by believing the message. That's the whole thing here in a nutshell. They believe the message. And Paul's saying, just what Abraham did is what God is calling you to do. Don't be adding anything to it. And so he says, God made a promise there. And so we look at this promise. We have who's, who, who are identified in this promise. It was Abraham. So we know who Abraham was, okay? And so then he says, and to his seed. So he starts talking about seed and, and then Paul brings out some depth on it. 
that seed there is singular. He gave this promise to Abraham and he was referring to a singular individual. Well, of all these descendants and people in Abraham's family, Paul brings it down and says, you know what? I got to give you a word on it. That seed was the Messiah. That seed was Christ. So God told Abraham, I'm going to make a mighty nation out of you. All the planet's going to be blessed because of you. And somewhere in that thing, he told Christ that as well. And the you he's talking about is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul brings that out. This thing is bigger than Abraham. This was about the, the Messiah and it was about Christ. So somehow God made a promise, gave his word to Christ about this, that the whole world will be blessed. And the whole world is blessed through whom? The Lord Jesus Christ. So when we get saved, when we come into this relation, it is really a picture of what God said to Abraham in a positive way. And so he's saying, okay, we're talking about these covenants now. You've got to remember that once you sign the dotted line, we got to stick with it. So then he goes back, okay, this is what God promised Abraham, okay? And we know all the nations of the world, all the people of the world, it even says all the families of the world will be blessed um, because of you. And what does that break down to me? If you go on and do things God's way, you get your faith and your trust put in the finished work of Christ and allow God to have his way in your life, your life will be blessed. Your family will be blessed. You are blessed. You're blessed to even start the relationship because the relationship gives you spiritual life to begin with and God, the Holy Spirit, to get through life. And then when life comes, you know, it's like the song we were singing today about love, you know, that whole thing. You're not afraid to die. You're not worried about dying. Yeah, and that was Floyd this week. Hey, God, what's up? You know, it's time to go home. I've been to nursing homes before where people are laying there and it's like, God, what's the deal? Come on, I'm here again. What is up with this? See, he's real to them. He's real to them. But really, most people aren't talking that. Most people are really afraid to die. Until you really get in there close with God, you're afraid to die. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, and, 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 and you can be a Christian who's, a, who's, excuse me, still afraid to die as well. You know, if you're really honest, because of the unknown, you're not sure, and you don't want to go somewhere where you're not sure. But boy, if you don't have any kind of relationship with God, you are already um, telling me you're afraid to die because the devil himself, the accuser, the slanderer, the liar, he keeps people in bondage because he says, whatever happens, don't you die because you're so afraid to die. COVID is playing into those fears for a lot of people. We have to really be honest about that. We're not trying to go somewhere weird or, 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 or do anything like that against people's convictions. No, no, no. But for some people, especially that don't have a relationship with God, that's why they're out there pounding the pavement. You better get that thing together so I can take a shot and go on with my life because I'm afraid I'm going to die and I don't have any kind of hope in my death and I don't want to die. As compared to somebody's like, Lord, what's the deal with you? This is your Lord, come on, it's time. Do you see the difference? And so we're blessed because of the seed and the promise made to the seed. So we go to verse 17 and he says, what I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God as to nullify the promise. So with all this language about covenants and you got to stay with it and you can't change it, you can't pencil something in, pencil someone out, you have the promise what God told Abraham and Christ and then he breaks it down and he says this, the law came 430 years after God gave Abraham that promise. 430 years later and he says, that does not pencil in anything that I told Abraham and Christ or erase anything I told Abraham and Christ. Everything I told them is exactly the same. And what I'm going to do with the law, I got some things I'm going to do with the law here. The law was a good thing. It helped them with their diet. It helped them with their health, helped them with their morality, their family. It was a good thing. But God was doing something different. He said, that did not kick away the promises. That did not change one thing. I'm still wanting you to come by believing the message. I have other purposes for the law. Some people need to see that they can't, they can't handle it. They, they, they need to see they're not righteous. Then we get into Timothy. And you know, 1 Timothy says, 
The law is good if somebody uses it lawfully. And then the first Timothy says, certain people need to be under the law. And it names them out. It names them out. Their sexual relationships. There's one you might be, you know, might be sensitive to right now. Slave traders or man kidnappers. All of that. There's a place that says, folks need some law. There's some people that need to be under some law because you do have to force them to do right. If, they, if you just leave nothing there, it's chaos. Are you following that? So the law has its place, but we need to be making sure we're that, that we're where we're supposed to be. So he's told them, you're not under that. But what he's talking about now is when I put that law in place, that didn't take away what I told Abraham and Christ. It's still in effect. And I got plans for the law. We'll take care of that. But what I told them, I don't break, break my promises. God said, if you got any doubt, let everybody else on this planet be a liar. But God's going to always tell the truth. God is going to always tell the truth. Who is that? Who is it? Tony Evans has said there's two opinions. Everybody else is in God's and everybody else is wrong. That's really the truth. That's really the truth. The truth is a person. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's a person. This is the written truth to help us get to know the living truth. And the living truth is a person. And so that's what's going on there. He said, I didn't change anything. I didn't change anything at all. So then remember now, we're arguing against some people who are telling them, you need to be under the law. You need to do this, you need to do that. That's what he's talking about. So everything he's saying here is addressing something. So we close today with verse 18, and here's what it says. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So these blessings that come because of this promise, Verse 18 is saying this, basically, if you can get it by keeping the law, that's what verse 18 is saying there, if you can get it by keeping the law, then the promise he gave Abraham is worthless. It's worthless. Do you see what I'm saying? It's totally worthless. It's like if somebody promised you a new car. Somebody told you, I'm going to go buy you a new car. We're going to go down there and get it. I'm keeping my word on it. And then I come up and say, you know what? You don't need to do that. I've got a new car for you right here. That's what the text is saying. It's like, if you can pull that off, then the promise is no good to you. If somebody else can do it. So what is he saying? If you can get the blessings of the promise by keeping the law and your own self-performance, your own self-strength and all of that, and you can attempt to pull off all of this, then he's saying the promise is no good, but there's a big but. But that's not really reality. No, God is going to keep his word. The only way you get these blessings are believing the message that you heard. The gospel of the grace of God. Okay, based on the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and so that's the only way you get it. So you can't get it by anything else. You remember another portion of this scriptures that we already studied. I'm gonna say it this way. This is another way we can say it. It's over in Galatians chapter two, and it's the very last verse. And it says this, I do not nullify the grace of God for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Do you know that you're righteous because of Christ? You're clothed in his righteousness. Your righteousness is a gift. And if you can pull off righteousness yourself, then Christ died for nothing. So we're back over here, same kind of concept. If you can get this thing by keeping the law and doing this all yourself, then the promise is no good. But what he's communicating is, oh no, that will is still good. See, that will is still good because we know who made it. God did, and he did it all by himself. And he doesn't lie and he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing in history. He knows what he's doing in time. He knows what he's doing with people. He knows what he's doing with nations. And he knows what he's doing with you as an individual in what is called the church, the body of Christ. And he said, you come stand on my promises, stand on my promises. And that's why we have to be so careful when we're getting into the word of God, make sure the promises you are standing on are body truth because the Bible's full of promises. You gotta make sure you're handling the word correctly. There's tons of promises here, okay? But are they to the body of Christ? Are they general principles? Are they about God's character? 
God is not telling you to do some things. And we're claiming things sometimes that God didn't say to the body. And when it doesn't happen, we are really disappointed. And some of us, it shakes us so bad that we've been silent with God for years. And we're mad at God and we're let down and we're disappointed. And it's not God. Everybody else is lying, not him. But sometimes we're holding on to promises that he did not give to us. We love to sing our songs. That's why it's so important. But every promise in this book is not yours. Even when we sing those songs, every promise in the book is mine. That is not true. And so sometimes, you know, it seems like I'm a little hard, but I know that some of you remember songs better than you remember sermons. And I want to make sure the songs are right. So when you remember them, you're remembering biblical truth. Are you getting that? So we sing every promise in the book is mine. And we believe that. And when something happens in our life, especially around these areas of death, we're claiming things, we're staying there, we're doing what we're doing. And then what we want doesn't happen. And if we're really honest, some of us really get attitude with God. And some of us say, I'm done with the relationship. Amen. So we want to be careful. So the bottom line is, God's promises are unchanging. He's going to always keep his word. No matter what happens, God is going to be faithful. And understand, it's all about God's grace. We are blessed because of the faithfulness of Christ. And it's all about him. He paid the price. He suffered. He did everything so you and I could have this relationship. And sometimes people think that grace is lesser. But actually, you have more under grace and more is expected because you have everything that's needed to be what God wants us to be, including me. We all do. Grace gives you more. Grace gives you blessings up front and says, walk in them. Law said, you just do it, just do it, and you can't do it. And so it really makes a difference. Sometimes we say, oh, that grace is, that's easy, and you know that's a lower standard. I'm closing with this. Can I pick on one? Tithing. Do you already know what I'm going to say already? Okay, okay, so that's in here. Get your cinnamon, your spices, go and pay the priest. You need to be taking care of some other things. All of that is a part of tithing. Now, I'm not, please, please give me, not criticizing anybody at all, but you understand that's under law. You do understand that. So where I'm going is this. Grace is a higher standard because there's a sheriff. Okay, listen to me now. Stay with me. I'm closing. I'm closing. We're early. I'm closing. The law says, okay, work with me. 10%. That's your number, right? Actually, it's 23%, but let's just go with 10%. The law says 10%. So we think, you know, you can do that without any, you know, let me throw my 10% in and praise God for you doing it, thanking God for you. But do you know that under grace, there's sheriff and the sheriff might say, Don Wright, 10%, you're a quadruple dipper. And what I want from you, Don, is I want the sheriff, see, give the law 10%. I'm done. I'm happy. I go home. The sheriff, see, a whole new system. The spirit says, Don, I know you're quadrupling, dipping. I know how much money you got. I got. Don, what I'd like from you under grace is, Don, give 90 and you keep 10 for yourself. We'd rather give the 10 because that's easy and that's safe. We don't really want to ask God what he would like for us to give because he really knows how much money we really have. And see, it takes relationship. It takes this new thing where he's talking about, we don't just keep laws. We don't throw money at things. We don't throw this at things. We're waiting for God, the Holy Spirit to share what he really wants us to do. That is grace. Which one of those do you think is really easier? Oh, is that not enough? Oh, my husband committed adultery. Where is that Matthew 19 at? Adultery. Got grounds for divorce, baby. Got grounds for divorce. Better ask God. He might say, you know what? I want you to forgive as you have been forgiven. That thing is so crazy. You heard the story. Man watching TV. Something comes on the screen. Wife asks him, are you lusting right now? He's honest. Yes, I am. Oh, Jesus said, 
if you've um, lusted, you've already done it. So now sign the papers for the divorce, baby. Grace says, you know what? Your motive is wrong. Your heart's wrong. You know, all of that. Maybe the Holy Spirit might say, maybe you should try to go see if we can get some counseling or something. Or maybe we need to do something. Are you, are you, you remember that? Now there was, there was a movie and I'm closing. I'm closing. There was a movie, uh, oh man, the green map, the black map, whatever, well, I can't remember. But anyway, this movie, the man was sending letters to this woman and she was reading the letters. Oh man, and I just love you so much. And he's doing all this. And, and then the lady says to, to, to her husband, hey, let's call him Ron. Ron, when am I gonna get some letters? When you learn how to cook a meal, that's when you get some letters. All of that is law. Law is performance. The Holy Spirit is a whole different sheriff, and he's going to reason with you. He's going to ask you to do some things that maybe you can't just get away and flip and throw somebody off. You, you see what I'm saying? That's law. We like that. But somebody told us that grace is easy believism and an easier way to go. Grace is a higher standard because we have so much more to work with to actually be what God wants us to be. Oh my goodness, we have so much more to work with. And so grace is a higher standard. I just picked on those things. I hope I didn't offend anybody. We don't mean anything by it. But I hope that those things make a, a good point because people understand money and they understand relationships. And so grace is a higher, a higher deal. And so that's the new sheriff. We don't do things by the rules of the law. We really find out what does this living God really want me to do. Green book. Next week, the next question is, well, why the law then? And so that's where we go in next week, Lord willing, verse 19. Let's close in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for your word. Father, we pray that your word was clear, that God the Holy Spirit had his way in all that was said and done. I pray that we will really understand about covenants and agreements that they're binding. And Father, that we really understand you made some promises to Abraham and to Christ that still are binding. They're still active to this place today where we are. And it's working with God by faith, believing the message believing the message to get saved, believing the message to go on in the life, believing the message after this life is over and all that you have for us from believing the message there. I pray we'll understand it, Lord, so that we can um, teach it to someone else, defend it or explain it. But most importantly, so we really have peace in our own hearts and lives. I pray for those of us who might be here today that really are afraid to die. We don't want to talk about it. Maybe it's not something you talk about at church because everybody's sitting on their pew acting like they're not afraid. I pray, Father, that we'll shed those, those, that, that armor, that self-protection that we have, Father. Um, we will cut the pretending and the wearing the masks and we'll be real. We need to talk about these things. Maybe you have a word that'll set me free. And so I just pray for all of us, Lord, that we will all be more authentic and less self-protective, starting with Pastor Ron. And I pray we'll be real where we can really talk about real issues. Death is all around us all the time. Who's next? Father, help us be real with these things. You have said, no, my promise didn't change because of the law. Don't come in here trying to keep the law to get saved, to go on with me or any of that. It's by believing the message. And so Father, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We pray, Father, today, you help us to really understand the gospel and what happened and why and how it brings so much to the table for us. And Father, we pray today that we will understand the difference between law and grace, that we'll understand the difference between um, Israel and the body, that we'll understand the things that we need to understand, Father, and that we really will be people who search the scriptures and look at who the promises are to and Father, really look for body truth. So thank you again for everything. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the faithful one. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I hope and pray that everybody's here is saved. And if there's any doubt in your mind about your salvation, it's on the bulletin every week. We'll be glad to talk with you about that as well. 
You know that um, going to church doesn't save anybody. You know, that doesn't save anybody. Being religious doesn't save anybody. Being in a Christian family doesn't save anybody. You have to have a personal relationship. You have to deal with this message personally. And I pray that um, you will do that if you have not. Please stand, we're gonna have a benediction and it's um, a very important one. This one is in the New Testament three times. And this is the verse that's quoted. It's coming from Habakkuk 2, 4. And we're gonna read it all off the screen and I'm going to read it with you this week. We're gonna read Habakkuk 2, 4. The bottom line is God is calling you to live by faith. Find out what he said in his word and do whatever is appropriate. Let's read Habakkuk 2, 4 together. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. You are dismissed. Have a great day.